Okay, okay guys, so uh, welcome to our first video lecture. Uh, we're gonna start this off sort of just classically doing these uh, Zoom style lectures. I may very well in the future try to use a blackboard or a chalkboard, uh, but for now this is simple and we're just gonna stick with this. So um, we're looking at section or chapter six, section one. And here we're gonna be learning about what are called discrete random variables. So <clears throat> we have so far in this class uh, looked at closely the basics of descriptive statistics and probability. And we're gonna see that in the world of random variables, what we're about to discuss, we see a, a happy marriage of those two um, those two ideas, the statistics, the descriptive statistics, and the probability. So first, let's talk definitions. What is a random variable in general, discrete or otherwise? So a, uh -oh, a discrete random variable, or sorry, a random variable is a numerical measure of some sort of outcome for an experiment so that its value is determined by chance. So we want to think of a random variable like any other variable, except now when we give it an input, we're not quite sure what the output's gonna be. When we've learned about variables in the past, which is to say we've learned about functions, mathematical functions, we knew exactly what the outcome would be for a given input. But here with random variables, we're not so sure. Now let's talk some notation real quick before we proceed. So when we're dealing with random variables, we typically denote a random variable with a capital X. So this is the random variable, which I'll often denote RV. Random variables take on values, and the values they take on, we often denote with a lowercase letter. So you'll often see in various texts, uh, and even when I write, the expression capital X equals lowercase x. And here the lowercase x is the value, whereas the capital X represents the random variable itself. So the big X can equal a number of different little X's, but the big X is really the main critter that we're looking at here. It is the random variable. Now these come in two flavors that we're gonna look at um, in this course. And the first will be, as the title indicates, discrete random variables. So we learned about discrete and continuous, uh, in the beginning of the class, and that's we did so precisely for this reason, so that we knew what it means for us to have a discrete random variable. So if it's discrete, then capital X, the random variable, takes on values that are either finite, so a finite set of possible values, or a countable number of values, okay? So <clears throat> there is a little bit of subtlety here that needs to be made clear. When I'm saying a
sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm having some technical difficulties, so I apologize. Uh, so getting back to it, we're looking at discrete random variables. And there's a subtlety here that needs to be explained, which is what does it mean? What is, what is it that's discrete? So the, dang it. Sorry, let me work this out. Okay, we'll see if this works better. So there's a subtlety here that I need to explain. We say the random variable is discrete if the variable itself takes on a finite or countable number of values. So there's an important distinction here, which is that the values that the big X is taking on themselves may be decimals, okay? So, you, so capital X could say equal 0.2, capital X could equal 1.5. The values that it's taking on themselves may look like they come from a continuous data set. But the discrete part here is saying that if we list all the possible values that X can take on, there will either only be a finite number of them or a countable number of them. So there may be 0.2s and 1.5s, but there's only a finite number of them. So there still isn't a continuum here that we can use, even if it looks like the random variable is taking on continuous values. So a subtlety. There obviously is then a notion of continuous random variables, which is just what you'd expect. Now our random variable X takes on an infinite number of possible values. So uncountably infinite. We'll look more closely at this guy uh, in the future. So in chapter five, we learned about probability models and probability models are really just another way of uh, naming what we call a probability distribution. So we will use this terminology far more often. And you've already seen distributions. We've looked at distributions, namely in the context of looking at the shape of histograms. We talked about the distribution of the data. So with random variables, we have the same sort of idea. A probability distribution is simply a list of all possible values that a random variable can take on. along with the corresponding probabilities. So usually when we're looking at probability distributions, we look at tables just like we did with probability models. So for a discrete random variable, we really can write down usually uh, a complete list of the possible values since it's a finite list. With continuous random variables, uh, we won't be able to do this, but we will have workarounds. So here we're talking about discrete random variables and we're gonna look at an example. Here, capital X, the random variable is going to represent the number of free throws that are made by a um, basketball player when they get three chances. Okay, so X tells me how many free throws were made when a random basketball player or uh, on some random experiment, we give a basketball player the, the ball, put them at the free throw line and say, take three shots. 
and we record how many shots they make. So X will tell us exactly how many shots were made. Now, we can represent the possibilities here uh, in a table. So capital X can equal either zero for no shots made, one shot, two shots, or all three shots can be made. P of X will tell us the probability of a player missing all the shots, making one, making two, or making three. So we're gonna say that they have 50% chance of making no shots. They've got a 25% chance of making one shot, a 15% chance of making two shots, and a 10% chance of making all three. So this, we would say, is a discrete probability distribution. We can see all the values that our big random variable can take on and all of its corresponding probabilities. Now, just like with probability models, probability distributions have rules that they must follow. And in fact, they're the same exact rules that we saw with probability models. We're just gonna write them a little bit more succinctly. So for a probability distribution, we must have that all of the individual probabilities are between zero and one, just as we saw with probability models. The second rule says that if we add up all of the probabilities, then that sum should equal one. So if I have a probability distribution, then it must meet these two requirements. And so just like we saw on the midterm exam, uh, you can be handed a probability distribution and be asked to confirm that it does in fact constitute a true probability distribution. So first we'd say, hey, look, all the probabilities are between zero and one. So that condition is met. We then say, okay, what about the second condition? If we take all the probabilities and add them, do we get one? So that would mean 0.5 plus 0.25 plus 0.15 plus 0.1. And in fact, when we add them all up, we do get one, check. So having met these two requirements, this does indeed constitute a probability distribution. And we can now use it to determine different uh, descriptive qualities of our random variable, as we'll see in just a second. So it's worth saying that we can actually graph these random variables. So we can graph them. And this is just like uh, the graphing of histograms, uh, but the only difference is instead of using bars, we're gonna use points. So if we go back to our free throw example and we wanted to graph that probability distribution, we would put the probabilities on the vertical axis and the various uh, possible values that our random variable, variable can take on on the horizontal axis. So that's zero, one, two, and three. And then we'd put a dot at each respective probability. So for zero, remember we had a probability of 0.5. So we'll put that dot at 0.5. For one free throw, we had a probability of 0.25. So we'll put a dot at 0.25. For two free throws, we had a probability of 0.15. So we'll put a dot at 0.15. And then finally, for three free throws, we had a probability of 10% or 
one. So we'll put that dot for three at one. And so this is what it means to graph a discrete random variable or discrete probability distribution. We put dots at the individual points and you can see that this sort of describes a shape. Um, but we, we, we don't necessarily always draw this in, but you could kind of imagine what the shape is. And looking at it, we would say that this is right skewed. Right? We have much more likelihood of making zero or one shots. And then as we, the possibilities go down and down as we get fewer shots. And so we get this sort of tail on the right. So right skewed or right tailed, you will also hear me say it's right a right tailed distribution <clears throat> okay so with the basics out of the way now we can look at what we can do with uh these probability distributions how are they useful and the first thing that we'll do is look at the mean of a random variable x so how can we use a probability distribution to make this calculation easier or just to, uh, is another way of phrasing this computation. So first notation for the probability distribution, we will always use mu uh, uh, for this random variable, I should say. We'll always use mu you because we this is a mathematical creature and so it's not coming from a sample per se this mu this calculation that we're making is supposed to represent the true population average now we don't just uh, uh, write mu by itself often we give it a subscript telling us what is the random variable that this mu is associated with okay so to compute this mu, we're going to be summing the values that the random variable can take on times their respective probabilities. So as an example, going back to the free throw, mu of x would be equal to zero for no shots made, times the probability of making no shots, which was 0.5 plus one times 0.25 plus two times 0.15 plus three times 0.1. So you, you can see that this actually is sort of an easier calculation in some ways. So if we take these, all of these uh, different uh, products and add them up, we get 0.85. Okay, so that is the mean for that discrete probability distribution. There's a few things that are worth saying here. One, notice that the mean does not actually equal one of the possible values of a random variable. It is not zero, it is not one, it is not two, it is not three. It's somewhere in between. So remember the mean is supposed to be sort of the balance point of the distribution and that balance point might fall somewhere between the possible values. So don't let that throw you off. The way we might think about this 0.85 is saying that you know 0.85 is definitely closer to one than it is to zero. So that means that we have a greater likelihood of making one shot than we do of missing all three. But still on average, most people miss all three shots. So we're still below one. On average, we don't, most people don't make the first shot or make any of the shots, but you have a higher likelihood of making the first shot than you do of making no shots. I know it's kind of confusing, but that's uh, how it works. Now, there's, an, there's more to be said here. This mu, again, 
is not an X bar. It is not a sample mean. This is a population mean. That's why we're using the terminal or the notation mu. So this is this 0.85 is representing the long run average. So if we were to conduct this experiment where we have a basketball player throw uh, three free throw shots and we did it over and 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 over again, and then we took the average of all those averages of all the sample means for each iteration of the experiment, that long run average would be 0.85. So this does indeed represent the population mean. So with that in mind, we introduced another idea, which is the expected value. Okay, uh, expected value really is just another name for the population mean, but there is an, some different notation and it does the terminology expected value uh, helps us differentiate between sample mean and population mean. So in terms of notation, we say E of X, the expected value of the random variable X. Now this E of X is literally synonymous with mu of X and therefore is calculated in exactly the same way. Okay, but it does, the terminology expected value really harkens to the fact that the average that we're computing here is a long run average. If, if you want, uh, again, think of conducting an experiment, the experiment being the free throws, we do it a million times, a million, million times, trillions, billions times, and we take the average of each um, iteration, and then we average all the averages. And when we compute the average of all the averages, and if we had infinitely many averages to average, then the answer that we would get from averaging infinitely many averages, that is the, uh, by averaging the averages of all the samples where we have infinitely many samples, then the value that we'd get by calculating that average of averages would be the expected value of X or mu of X, okay? So we use this terminology because it's, uh, it's a little bit more suggestive and it also makes it into a function. So now this E of something is now a function, a function of a random variable. Whereas this mu of X really just represents the number, uh, the value that we get when we calculate. So this is a little bit more useful for us uh, notationally, but it's computed in precisely the same way. There is no difference between the expected value and mu of X. Now, just like uh, with, when we are talking about descriptive statistics, we could calculate means, which were the measures of central tendency. And we can also calculate standard deviations and variance which were measures of dispersion. So we have the same thing here. Now it's the standard deviation of the random variable X. And since this, since we have a probability distribution, we can calculate this a little bit differently. So one way is to take the square root of the sum of the square differences between the values and the mean, and then multiply each of those by its respective probability. So this is one way of calculating standard deviation. This can be reworked and we can show that it can be calculated in this way. another equivalent way of calculating it. And here we're just summing the squares of the values times the, the probabilities. And then once we may, do that whole entire sum, we subtract from the entire sum, the square of the mean. 
So this is one way of calculating the standard, another way of calculating the standard deviation. The interpretation and meaning of the standard deviation is precisely the same. It gives us a measure of dispersion. Now, they do not talk about this in the book for whatever reason, or maybe they're just going to get to it later. But we can also talk about the variance. And the variance, remember, is related directly to the standard deviation. It's just the square of the standard deviation. So whatever the standard deviation is, if we square it, we get the variance. It turns out that calculating the variance often is easier than calculating the standard deviation. And so I advise you, if you're asked to find the standard deviation, to instead calculate the variance first and then compute the standard deviation. Now there's actually, a really easy way of doing this using expected value. And I'll show you how. So first the equation, it turns out that the variance of a random variable X is equal to the expected value of the values squared minus the expected value of the random variable X squared. So, here you have the random variable squared, and then you take its expected value. Here you take the expected value of the random variable and then square it. When you subtract those two results, you get the variance. So let me show you an example. So using our free throw example, first we'll calculate the expected value of x squared. So this is by definition, x squared, the sum of x squared times p of x. So that would be zero squared times 0 0.5 plus one squared times 0 0.25 plus two squared times 0 0.15 plus three squared times 0.1, okay? So if we calculate this, we get the number 1.75. So that is the expected value of the, our random variable squared. We've already computed before what the expected value is of x. So remember that this was 0.8 five. It's the same as the mean. So to get the variance, all we've got to do is take this result and subtract away from it the expected value of x squared. So if we do that, we get 1.0275. So this is a pretty straightforward way of calculating the variance, simpler than what you've seen so far. And what's great is once we have the variance, all we've got to do to get the standard deviation is take the square root. Sorry. So take the square root of the result that we got before and we get the standard deviation. So this concludes uh, section 6.1. You learned about the discrete random variables, the uh, um, expected value, standard deviation and variance. Uh, and we are going to do a lot more work with this stuff and look at um, some specific probability distributions moving forward.